Welcome to Shakespeare Full Circle, a journey of a circuitous nature into the mind of the Bard of Avon, or as you become more familiar, Uncle Will. I'm your host, Kari Marshall. As we begin Series 4, I am filled top-toe with anticipation, brimming with effervescent expectancy, eagerly hopeful for our long-awaited return to our avuncular Avonian's antics. It's a fun one today, involving a merchant, in Venice of all places, and in keeping with the water theme, we'll take a little trip up the Mississippi River. Now, with a relaxing exhale, we turn to our bated breath. But first things. Uncle William came up with this phrase sometime before 1605 for his use in his Merchant of Venice. In Act 1, Scene 3, we find our prospective moneylender Shylock with Antonio, who is in desperate need of a loan, as it turns out for his friend Bassanio, who wants to marry Portia and feels that he must seem to be a man of means to do so. One problem. Our Signor Antonio has been, let's just say, less than cordial to our Jewish usurer in the past. Signor Antonio. Many a time, and oft, in the Rialto, you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Well, then it now appears you need my help. What should I say to you? Should I not say, hath a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend three thousand ducats? Or shall I bend low? And in a bondsman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this, O oh, fair sir, you spat on me on Wednesday last, you spurned me such a day, another time you called me dog, and for these courtesies I'll lend you thus much money. What is interesting here is that our use of the phrase has come to be synonymous with expectant apprehension, or akin to being on tenterhooks, which wasn't actually one of Uncle Will's, by the way. But anyway, almost a sense of holding one's breath. But Uncle Will used it in a slightly but significantly different way. Shylock uses the phrase as if to convey a sense of humility, speaking low and unobtrusively, almost in an ironically subservient manner, given the context. But back to baited. This one is actually fairly simple. That archaic word was meant to blunt, as Uncle Will would use in Hamlet when Laertes' foil is unbated and envenomed to cut Hamlet in the final dueling scene. But that wasn't the origin. Blunting breath? No. As we know, Uncle Will was very fond of his meter, and in order to make the sentence scan for him, he decided to create a new word by lopping off an A from abated, transforming our three-syllable word into the more scannable two. And this may be where some of the confusion lies. Baited from abate has no I, but bait, as in fishing, does. And speaking of fishing, some 300 years later, Mark Twain would solidify the phrase for American readers in his Adventures of Tom Sawyer. In the courtroom scene during the murder trial of Muff Potter, our only witness to the crime takes the stand. Tom began, hesitatingly at first, but as he warmed to his subject, his words flowed more and more easily. In a little while every sound ceased but his own voice. Every eye fixed itself upon him. With parted lips and bated breath, the audience hung upon his words, taking no note of time, wrapped in the ghastly fascinations of the tale. And with the jury in, now knowing what we know, as Uncle Will could have written, hopefully the concupiscible nook shot and jack and ape of ignorance has been, at least in regards to this phrase, well and truly abated. Well, alas and alack, my friends, that's all we have time for. Join us again next time for another circuitous journey into the mind of Uncle William. I'm Kari Marshall. Farewell until next time. Shakespeare Full Circle is a production of WGTE Public Media. You can learn more and download all episodes at wgte.org slash sfc or wherever you get your podcasts.